Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Rector, Mr. Vice Rector, Dean, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, I feel more than honored and humbled. Uh, thank you very much for this huge honor you provided to me. And um, uh, also thank you for the opportunity here to talk to you uh, about uh, the work, uh, especially about the joint work uh, we carried out together with colleagues uh, from here, from uh, the University uh, of Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy here um, in Sofia. So uh, I titled my presentation Road Modern Road Engineering Opportunities and Challenges. And I structure my lecture in a way that I first, because probably the one or other uh, uh, is not so familiar with uh, TU Wien and with the Technical University uh, and my background, so I was already more uh, than enough introduced. Uh, and I already mentioned that I'm more than humbled uh, about uh, uh, this um, uh, honor speech uh, from the Dean. So I will first give a short overview to TU Wien, and then I will talk about the challenges we are facing in engineering and especially in road engineering. Uh, and I will give you some um, uh, answers probably, uh, and I will show you some uh, projects uh, we carried out together like I mentioned, with students, with uh, master students and PhD students here from this university in a joint, um, in a joint uh, program. So first, a few words uh, very briefly. So I called it TU Wien at a glance. Um, the technical university you see here, uh, the Old historical building is in the middle, in the heart of Vienna, in the middle of the city, right near Karlsplatz. Uh, we have um, about 5,000 employees, and I was already asked. We have eight faculties. Uh, one faculty is the Faculty of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering, which I'm heading, and uh, we have about 375 to 380 uh, full-time equivalent employees, so that's about 500 uh, people, uh, which I'm responsible for at my faculty. Uh, yes, and uh, of course we are dedicated to educate young, to motivate, educate, and prepare young students for uh, their practice, for the, to be a practical engineer in classical engineering, but also in natural sciences. We have at the moment, about uh, 26,000 to 27,000 students. And at the Faculty of Civil Engineering, at the moment, we have a number of 3,500, 3,200 students uh, uh, we are responsible for. So uh, the Faculty of Civil Engineering, um, uh, we have uh, recently thought about our mission statement. What are we? Uh, what defines us? What are we standing for? Uh, and uh, the building infrastructure is so important uh, for our future and for the future, future generations. So we are standing for building future environment. I think this is a very good motto uh, we dedicate our work for. Of course, uh, we want to pursue teaching and research uh, at the highest level, and as um, faculty of civil engineering, as well as the faculty here uh, in this uh, university, actually we have to play a vital role in improving the quality of life and creating a sustainable world in very challenging times. And I will come to that a little bit later. And also we have to educate future decision, maker, decision makers that uh, they are leading into the future, future um, building, future environment. Uh, and uh, 
just to relax now after this uh, um, uh, ceremony, I brought you a short video where our mission statement, so what we are standing for, what we defines us, is stated in a very s a small video so that you get an impression about our faculty uh, and what we are standing for. So could you please play this video? I hope it works. This is our new laboratory. It was uh, recently constructed and opened. We have uh, really excellent facilities for experiment, uh, experimental work. What is most important at our faculty is uh, mutual appreciation for the co-workers and with the students. This is, by the way, the dean's office. So it's a very nice workspace. Then what defines us is that we want to combine, we want to bridge experimental and theoretical research. I think that's important as, an, uh, as, a, as engineers where we finally have to apply all the knowledge to the constructed uh, environment. Then we are very strong in theoretical modeling and I will show you some slides on that, also in road engineering. What becomes more and more important is interdisciplinary so we have to work with other professionals uh, to uh, cre create a more sustainable world. This is uh, uh, the facility at our uh, new lab. As uh, engineers, we have to lead, we have to uh, push innovation. This is uh, one example of a very new uh, uh, innovative uh, bridge construction with, with where the TUV and our fa faculty was uh, leading and uh, was, it was also patented. Mm -hmm. And as I already mentioned, uh, this is our laboratory, uh, water laboratory and uh, uh, other laboratories. So we have uh, to educate the leaders of the future. Next slide, please. So I already was uh, introduced, so I will skip uh, this slide. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for um, honoring me and uh, my CV. Uh, so I want to come uh, to my presentation, my uh, second part of the presentations, modern road engineering. Uh, what are the huge challenges we are facing, especially in engineering, in civil engineering, but uh, especially in, um, in road engineering. The younger generation uh, claims that we have to take care of our planet. Um, climate change is really something which threatens not only us, but the next and the uh, generation after the next generation. So you ha we have to face that and we have to fight climate change. I think beside all these uh, cruel wars in Ukraine and now uh, in uh, the Near East, this is uh, in the far perspective, the most challenging um, threat for humanity. So we have as engineers give solutions what are the huge challenges, especially in transportation? Uh, I'm talking here especially about Europe. So uh, these five um, challenges uh, uh, are especially uh, related to European citizens. So the one thing which is also uh, known here in Bulgaria is the demographic problem. So people are getting older and older uh, and uh, we don't have uh, 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 the, the same growth in the young generation. So a lot of people, 30% of the people will be uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2060 will be uh, older than uh, 65. So 
that means that we have to plan our transportation systems also in regards to the needs of this older generation, of this uh, elder ge generation. On the other hand, the population is growing up to 9 billion people. So there's a huge need of additional transportation, of additional roads, of additional train, of additional uh, transportation systems. And I already mentioned that we are uh, facing a huge threat in respect to climate change and especially the transportation sector. 97% of the energy, of the energy consumption of the um, uh, transport uh, sector is still based on fuel oil, so on fuels, on non-sustainable energy. We have to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And another thing is that a lot of people, more and more people are living in urban spaces, in urban areas. So looking especially on this uh, greenhouse uh, emissions, uh, and my focus is uh, of course on this long-term threat uh, on climate change, you see that um, the transport sector uh, is responsible for about 20 to 25. Here the figure is, uh, differs a little bit uh, from uh, statistic to statistics, but 20 to 25 uh, percent, the transport sector is responsible for this uh, greenhouse gas emissions, with, which really affects uh, the climate change. And if you look here, the road sector, so um, heavy traffic, and private traffic are more than 70% responsible uh, for the greenhouse gas emissions of the transport sector. So road traffic is a huge factor for climate change. We need a transformation and how can this transformation succeed? How can we achieve from the situation we are now where we need uh, uh, economic growth to a more stable world? And I think this is a very nice picture. So I'm a very visual person. So I think if we want to change, we need also a visualization of this change. And I think this uh, um, graph here, this picture shows very nice the change we need to a more green, to a more sustainable world. And uh, especially in road engineering, um, we have to meet um, several uh, sustainable development goals, the so, so, uh, the so named SDGs in road engineering. Um, you are certainly aware of the 70 SDGs uh, which were developed um, uh, in a, um, by the United Nations uh, in the 2030 agenda of where we have to dedicate ourselves, our uh, societies to achieve these seven uh, sustainable development goals to transform this, our world to a more sustainable environment. And especially in road engineering, we have uh, four goals we have to meet. The one and where we can contribute significantly. The one is decent work and the economic growth. This is which is necessary in our world, but the growth must be uh, or may not be harmful to our climate. Industry innovation and infrastructure, infrastructure actually this is the heart of our business, road engineering or infrastructure engineering, sustainable city and communities. Here we have a huge contribution, I mentioned that a lot of persons, 80% of the Europeans, will live in big, large cities. So we have to make our cities, our urban areas more livable. And of course, 
we have to dedicate us, uh, us to the fight of climate change, so to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions significantly in the next 10 to 20 years. So how can we achieve that? And this is more a personal statement. You can agree or you cannot agree or me disagree with me, but this is a personal statement. What are the drivers for towards sustainability? From my point of view, we can only achieve sustainable growth with a free market, with a free economy. There is no better system. But of course, we may not leave alone the poor and who cannot, um, uh, who cannot um, cope uh, the pace our economy and our market is uh, given. So we need a social market system where we also look on the people who uh, need uh, social security, who need uh, social standards. The other uh, pillar of sustainability from my point of view is we need regulations. So we need strong regulations. It's a boundary conditions like we have in mathematics and they should be the same for everybody. For the uh, player on the market, it's very important that everybody plays the same game. So if you play uh, chess, you want to have that your other player has, uh, is, is working or is uh, playing a, in, according to the same rules. So we have very strict rules and within this boundary conditions, the free market will um, happen. Another thing is, another very uh, strong pillar from my point of view is civil uh, society. So we need a strong civil society um, that pushes forward sustainability. And last but not least, and this is a little bit our business here at the universities, the same as the university in TU Wien, is a very strong pillar uh, which is uh, uh, also uh, carrying and bearing at least the economy is research and innovation. And this is our business. And I want, that's why I want to um, uh, dedicate the next slides, especially to what we can achieve in research uh, in respect to push forward, to drive uh, the, sustainability, the, the SDG goals. And uh, here I want to focus especially on projects uh, we carried out in cooperation uh, and in a strong joint um, work with uh, students and PhD um, colleagues uh, from uh, this university here to show a little bit also uh, this joint work and the joint efforts uh, uh, we had in the last year. And I want to um, uh, start with uh, the contributions to a more sustainable road material. And here uh, we developed very, in a very basic res uh, research, uh, new material models for pavement materials, sustainable road construction materials. So if we have the models, we can develop more sustainable materials. We can create innovative pavement constructions. And finally, we have an existing, a lot of an existing infrastructure, which is aging, which, which uh, 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 needs rehabilitation. And uh, it's very important that we assess the existing infrastructure uh, by service and to manage the rehabilitation in a proper and sustainable way. So a few words, a, a few slides to pavement modeling. Um, why, is, uh, why need we very 
complex models uh, of uh, pavement materials. The reason for that is that we, that we have uh, a very complex material behavior. Uh, most of the roads are built uh, of asphalt. So we have a lot of uh, flexible pavements, how we call them. And asphalt uh, is a very complex material. So it consists of three phases of binder, which is bitumen, of a mineral aggregate, uh, and of uh, a, a third phase, which is uh, air voids. So we need a very complex model. So we created a very complex model to uh, better understand the material behavior and finally to uh, design more sustainable materials. And uh, uh, the model we created is a uh, so-called um, uh, multi-phase uh, model. So uh, we uh, define what we call representative volume elements on the different scales of observation. So we go down to the nanoscale and up to the macro scale. So it's, uh, we upscale the uh, engineering properties of uh, the different phases uh, with a mathematical model. And we are using uh, as input the volume fraction in each of each phase, the morpholo morphology and the interaction be in between the, uh, the matrix and uh, the inclusions in this representative uh, model. We need very complex, um, uh, what we call identification experiments to identify on each scale uh, the material parameters, the engineering properties. And the advantage is now that if we change, for example, the uh, property of bitumen, we can upscale the property up to the macro scale and we don't have uh, to do all this very exhausting and time consuming and uh, expensive uh, uh, tests again. So if we change here something on the bitumen scale or on the mortar scale, we can easily upscale it and come to a very uh, um, easy and straightforward solution for a new mix design. Uh, I don't want to go uh, into deep because this is very deep in uh, uh, micro mechanics, and I don't want to bother you with all these uh, formulations, but I want to show you here to uh, define mathematically this uh, RVE, so this representative volume element with the different material phases. We need here the so-called Escherby tensor to for the homogenization uh, of uh, uh, this uh, representative volume element. And here, in this very basic research, a significant contribution uh, was made uh, by um, a colleague, by a PhD student here from the university, from your faculty, uh, Valentin Donev, and he could contribute especially to a much better and uh, much reliable um, uh, calculate this uh, homogenization tensor by characteristic uh, experiments with the dynamic shearometer on this uh, viscoelastic material, the binder, and on with ultrasonic experiments uh, on the aggregates, on the mineral aggregates. So now that we understand the material and we can really design on scratch on the computer the material that we understand it now, the next step is that we can we need some advanced testing methods to test the new materials in the lab. And uh, as it was mentioned, we, I, was, I uh, was the founder of a Christian Doppler Labor uh, in, uh, starting in 2002, so it's now more than 10 years ago, uh, that we started to um, innovate the material testing, especially on road materials. So we uh, developed an own um, uh, testing device, testing method, it's called the Viennese Binder Aging Protocol uh, to simulate in the laboratory in a short term the long term aging of the binder. So the binder brittles 
And that's the problem with the distress in the, in the pavement. So that uh, leads to cracking. And we can now simulate uh, in uh, in very accelerated way the long-term um, aging. And here, especially a lot of students from this university, master students contributed to, um, um, uh, to carry out a lot of uh, tests uh, with this new uh, Viennese binder uh, aging protocol. Then, of course, going from the binder, we have to do the same tests uh, on the asphalt. So we also um, uh, created a new test uh, to simulate the aging of the asphalt the same. So not only of the binder, but also of the bitumen, but also of the asphalt. And then uh, uh, we introduced a uh, very new, what we called performance testing of the asphalt itself. So we have uh, in asphalt in low temperatures, the low temperature cracking is a huge problem uh, in pavement structures. And we created this, uh, a, a so-called cooling test to simulate the situation in the pavement, in the structure, to simulate the uh, strengths and uh, also the distress situation of the asphalt under loading in the laboratory, the same at high temperatures, not cracking is the problem, but rutting. So the deformation, the plastic deformation uh, of, um, of the structure. Here we created a uh, triaxial uh, uh, cyclic uh, compression test uh, where we can uh, very re realistically uh, simulate the um, uh, the load, um, the loading uh, from the trucks, from the truck tire, from the truck tires of uh, the structure, and also fatigue. So the repeti repetitive loading of the structure, the fatigue uh, of the uh, asphalt is uh, very important for the design life. So to extend the design life, which is leads to more sustainable pavement structures, to extend the design life, we need to know about a very important engineering property, which we call fatigue. And uh, here also a, um, a very recent distribution from a colleague from here from the university it was a very theoretical work. Uh, so we have the material models, we have the test in the laboratory, but still uh, we have a, uh, some gaps in the prediction. And here we introduced for the first time uh, a neural network. Today you, today you would say artificial intelligence to better predict uh, the, ex the uh, experimental uh, engineering property. In, in this case, it's uh, the stiffness. Uh, and the predicted, you see, it's very close the ex to the experiment when we adding to our experiments and to our theoretical model, also neural networks or artificial intelligence. So coming from the theoretical model to the testing in the laboratory on the material, of course we have the next step is into the structure, into the pavement, into the engineering structure. And also here, uh, very nice contrib contributions were made by a colleague colleague from uh, your university here in our team. And you see here what are the input parameters to finally uh, predict the service life of a pavement, of a pavement structure of, a, of our uh, or airfield structure. So the most important input parameters is of course the loading. And you see we have a lot of what we call dynamic loading because of the unevenness of the road itself. So you have not only a static loading, a constant load, but a very, uh, sometimes very high accelerated dynamic loads. And we simulated this with a very um, advanced um, model, interaction model between uh, road and trucks. You see here the mechanical model and introduced this model in our pavement structure and together with information from the climate and from the structure itself, we can now much better predict the service life and also identify the 
important parameters to extend this service life. And the longer the service life, the more sustainable such a construction is. Um, another very innovative uh, rehabilitation method is uh, if we have an old distressed asphalt pavement that we put an overlay on this uh, asphalt pavement, a concrete, a very thin, ultra thin concrete uh, uh, layer. We call it ultra thin white topping. White topping because concrete is white or more white than asphalt. So there are some uh, important advantage, advantages uh, in this uh, type of construction, but we have two types of uh, materials, very different materials. So the, uh, mat uh, the engineering properties of concrete is very different uh, from the time dependent uh, uh, and uh, temperature dependent uh, property of asphalt. So we have a problem at the interface between the concrete and the asphalt. And uh, uh, so far uh, in pavement models, uh, we, they just assumed a full bond between the concrete and the asphalt, but this is not true. This is not the reality. So you can also assume if, uh, or imply a friction model, but you don't know which we are, the, uh, the level of the, friction, uh, of the friction. So what we did is actually we um, assessed or we introduced a very new, very advanced model, the cohesive zone model, CZM, uh, uh, with the CZM parameters, uh, which we receive from shear uh, testing uh, between the interface of the concrete, uh, concrete and of the asphalt in the laboratory. So we introduced this uh, very advanced um, cohesive zone model into uh, uh, a finite element model of the pavement and uh, came to very new, very exciting um, design rules for this very innovative pavement construction. And it's important not only uh, to uh, do the things uh, on the computer, to do the things com uh, more or less theoretically, but it's very important also to test it uh, in if it's really practicable and if you really can apply it. And you see here a test track. Here's, you see here the, the paper, uh, the concrete paper uh, in a test site near Vienna in uh, Lower Austria. Uh, and uh, you see here the, the colleague, uh, Christina, who uh, uh, mounted here a lot of uh, sensors, of so-called strain gauges, where we monitored if, uh, we, if the prediction of our theoretical model uh, is feasible and if uh, we uh, produce uh, reasonable results uh, which are related to the reality, to the loading, which really happens in the field. Another uh, innovative uh, method for the rehabilitation um, uh, was uh, uh, implemented here in Bulgaria uh, in uh, a PhD study by Marin Donchev. He is here and uh, I'm very happy that he listens to this, to his own work here now, which I can um, uh, 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 present in a few words. Of course, the, the, uh, the work uh, uh, itself was uh, very comprehensive. But uh, what was the, the problem? The problem is you see here a very distressed old layer. We, we, uh, he chose a, uh, a test section here uh, near Sofia, a very distressed uh, layer. And the question is what should we do with this uh, old asphalt, with this very brittle uh, and cracked asphalt? Uh, we call it reclaimed asphalt. Uh, and the idea uh, that came up is that we uh, uh, mill it together with the, into the existing structure and stabilize it. So you see here the milling of the old structure uh, and uh, it is uh, milled and uh, added uh, with a hydraulic binder and we tested different hydraulic binders. And you see here the structural assessment in the site. You see here 
the slab compaction of this uh, hydraulic binder with a huge amount of uh, 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 reclaimed asphalt, which is completely unusual up to then. So this was really new. And uh, we uh, investigated, uh, so we compacted uh, this uh, hy uh, hydraulic bound layer with the uh, wrap, uh, um, then drilled uh, specimens out of it, uh, tested the stiffness and the strength and also the low temperature behavior in our laboratory uh, and came to uh, very important uh, relations between the amount of, um, of cement, of hydraulic binder you include, the stiffness, the strength, and uh, comb combined the stiffness and the strength, so very important engineering properties we need to design the pavement, to properly design the pavement. And this was now implemented, uh, as far as I know already, in the Bulgarian analytical pavement design uh, for this kind, for this new type of full depth rehabilitation of old uh, pavements. And there are a lot of uh, needs, so there's a huge need on rehabilitation, especially in Bulgaria. So there's a new um, uh, construction method for re rehabilitation now uh, defined in your standards. And a lot of people are working in urban areas. And uh, in urban areas, um, especially block pavements, are more and more um, applied. The reason is because uh, as in pedestrian ways, um, uh, it's uh, from the architectural feeling, uh, if you walk uh, in a very monotone, asphaltic or concrete pavement, it's completely different. Uh, if you walk in a space uh, with this kind of block pavings. The problem is that we have still very high loading on these block pavements. And the problem in Austria was that uh, a lot of these recently constructed uh, pavements only lasted five to seven years and then they failed. So there was a huge need to a new design method uh, for uh, this uh, uh, block pavement uh, constructions. And you see here, uh, we um, could um, bring a, a so-called heavy vehicle simulator from uh, Switzerland, from the EMPA to Austria. We designed uh, different test fields where we um, implemented different, very innovative pavement types uh, of these block pavements. Uh, instrumented uh, this test site and tested it. And uh, we could also now recommend new standards for block pavement for urban areas. And I think this is also very important, for example, for other countries. We implemented it already in, uh, in the Austrian standards, but I'm sure that there is a lot of need also in Germany. They already um, um, use our Austrian standards, but also, for example, here in, in, um, in Bulgaria to adapt the results from this research and to bring it into practice here uh, in the block pavements, in the urban areas here in Bulgaria. And last but not least, this is my final chapter in uh, cooperation. I said we need the materials, uh, we need to simulate it, we need to test it, we need innovative structures which we can calculate and apply and design. And then we have a huge need uh, to assess existing pavements with a survey and to classify the damage of the existing uh, pavements. And you see here the structure of what we call assessment management. So the assessment management of existing pavement infrastructure uh, which should be coupled with a life cost analysis. I won't go into deep in that, but here also uh, a very important uh, um, contributions were made from colleagues uh, which studied here together in this double degree um, program uh, with TU Wien, with uh, our institute. Uh, and you see here um, a very theoretical uh, work uh, on what happens uh, if we um, 
divide uh, the sections of uh, survey into uh, di with different distances uh, and what are the mistakes uh, uh, that we make and how reliable uh, the results are in uh, dependence of the um, sections we are looking at. And then also a very theoretical approach uh, uh, was uh, recently published uh, where we also looked uh, on the complexity of uh, this optimization problem uh, for the rehabilitation of the existing uh, infrastructure. So uh, in the beginning of my presentation I asked, so I said we have a need for transformation. How can we proceed, how can we succeed with the transformation? So the one answer is we need transport infrastructure, there's no doubt about that. We need transportation infrastructure as backbone of our society. Especially, in when, we, we of course have to design it more environmentally friendly. Uh, we have also uh, to improve the maintenance and the operation, especially of the high deep performance network. So you see here in the picture both in parallel train and road. So there's no competition. So they should uh, at least, um, we need both. And we need this backbone uh, to interconnect our European regions, the big cities, the big centers of Europe. And on the other hand, uh, like I said, a lot of people, a lot of more people, older people, we live in urban areas. So we have also designed our cities more environmental friendly. So especially in cities, we have to promote alternative forms of mobility. Uh, also foster a new existence of non-motorized and partially motorized uh, mobility like cycling, walking, and of course, uh, we have uh, to electrify our private uh, transport in urban areas. So these are some short, quick answers to my question I asked in the beginning, what uh, are the modes, how we can we uh, transform, how can we be successful to reach this uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm coming to my conclusions. We see, and I hope we agree on that, that because of ecological energy policy and demographic challenges, our society, especially the European society, undergoes really a serious change. And we have to be really determined on a more sustainable infrastructure, including the construction, maintenance of the existing transport infrastructure, and this is really essential. So and from my deepest heart, and I'm burning for that, I'm sure we need, as a part of the solution, technology, innovation, and of course, road engineering as part of the engineering of our society. And uh, I want, want to conclude my presentation, uh, my talk, uh, with a quote uh, from uh, the very famous philosopher, uh, Karl Popper, Austrian philosopher, Karl Popper. And actually he is the father of uh, research uh, ethics uh, in the world of, of new modern research ethics uh, here today. And he says in his very um, recommended work, the open society and it, it's in enemies. So if you don't have a book to read for, if you don't know it and you, you don't have a book to read for Christmas, buy it and read it. And he says, we can improve our world by taking responsibility. 
Thank you very much for these many, many years of excellent cooperations with the University of Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy here in Sofia and uh, for this high distinction uh, of awarding me an honorary doctorate. Thank you very much. <laughs>